Welcome everyone. My name is Pravin Rokaya. I'm the science coordinator of the Global Water Futures uh, Core Modeling and Forecasting Team. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you today uh, to the special webinar on special meteorological data. Uh, today we have Dr. Martin Clark with us. Uh, Martin is a professor of hydrology and associate director of the Center for Hydrology and the Canmore Cold Water Laboratory of the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, he is also the fellow of the American Geophysical Union and former editor-in-chief of the journal Water Resources Research. Uh, Martin is also one of the two principal co-investigators of the core modeling and forecasting team and also the faculty lead of the geospatial intelligence team. Uh, I want to start this uh, webinar by thanking Martin uh, for graciously accepting our request uh, to share some of his expertise in hydrometrology. Uh, the webinar today would be about uh, 45 minutes of presentation uh, followed by 15 minutes of question and answer session. Uh, Martin, we are happy and grateful to have you here today. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, okay, great. Um, well, um, let's get started. Thanks, Prabhin, um, for inviting me um, to, give the, to give this webinar. And I think what we wanted to cover today was to talk a little bit about um, some of the meteorological data sets that are used um, throughout the core modeling program, um, what data sets are available, and what some of the limitations are with some of the data sets um, that, that are there. Um, so I'll go through, and I'm going to, you can see the outline that we've got here. Um, so I'll start with providing a little bit of a motivation. And um, this slide um, is um, trying to encapsulate um, a lot of the work that we do in the um, core modeling uh, um, program in Global Water Futures. So this is talking about the work that we do for hyd hydrological prediction applications. So typically what we do when we're interested in forecasting is that we run a model, a time-stepping um, mechanistic model up to the start of the forecast to estimate the initial hydrological states. And um, then, we, then we run it into the future um, with an ensemble of weather forecasts or climate scenarios um, to provide um, some notion of change. So there's a lot that goes into this. If we start on the left um, for um, our initialization period or the historical period that we have, so we may have station data or reanalysis products that we're using as, 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 um, as, as the model input. Um, that uh, those products are typically not on um, the resolution of the model of our hydrology model that we need. So we need to do some type of spatial interpolation and data fusion in order to get the information that we need for our for our model elements. And that that step is providing us with the spatial meteorological forcing data that we need. Um, um, to produce our model simulations, um, James, um, you're not on. You're not on mute at the moment. Um, so then, um, as we're running our process-based hydrological model, and um, we're typically assimilating observations into that hydrological model, especially in the forecasting context, um, because our forecasts um, depend on the um, initial hydrological states at the start of the forecast. Or we get a lot of predictability from the knowledge of snow and soil moisture at the start of the forecast period. Um, and throughout history, um, we can have um, hydrological model simulations um, through a um, long period of history that we may be able to use um, for different purposes. Um, often in the uh, multi-decadal um, work that we're doing for historical hydrological simulations, um, there's currently little, little attention given to assimilation of hydrological observations, but you know that's something that will grow as we're um, pushing this forward. So now we've got the initial hydrological states and now we want to talk about stream flow forecasting or um, scenarios of change in the future. Um, for the um, short-term um, forecasts, um, when we're going out, um, for like one week or even even a season, we get a lot of um, a lot of predictability from our knowledge of the initial hydrological states. Um, so um, we've got our process based model again, and we can have um, output from numerical weather prediction models, um, which are downscale to provide um, the meteorological forecasts at the for the spatial elements of our hydrological model that we can use as forcing data for our hydrological model. Um, those are used to um, produce hydrological forecasts. There may be some type of statistical post-processing and then prediction products that we would share with the community. Um, when we're going out um, for scenarios of change, the initial hydrological states become much less important. 
and we're taking output from climate models we may do some spatial downscaling or bias correction of the output from a climate model or an earth system model um, to provide the climate scenarios at the spatial scale that our model is running so we're running the model um, using those climate scenarios to provide hydrological projections um, and perhaps you know some statistical post-processing of those hydrological projections um, um, to provide um, the prediction products um, that are useful so that's kind of a broad overview of how everything kind of comes together. Um, if we step back and think about our motivation, the gridded hydrometeorological data that we have are used to force land models, hydrology models, ecology models, um, to verify the numerical weather prediction model output. Um, but the um, generation of a data set, as we'll, as we'll get into, has got many methodological choices and it's inherently uncertain. And um, very few of the hydrometeorological products that we use have got uncertainty characteristics. So we'll circle back on this at the, at the end of the talk and talk about how we can begin to explicitly characterize uncertainty in some of the products that we're developing. If we provide an example, um, if um, we look at a, um, a Gaussian mountain, um, um, and um, we pretend that we've got um, three um, climate stations um, on this Gaussian mountain and our goal is to estimate um, the temperature at the top of the mountain. So um, whoops. So we can have um, have different um, estimated lapse rates. So um, the lapse rates are different if we look at the differences between the different pairs of stations and um, the answer that we get at the at the top of the mountain can, you know, have a fairly large uncertainty range. Um, some other methodological choices, you know, that are important when we're developing the data sets, uh, the interpolation scheme, um, which data is included, what's the spatial resolution, what's the time step, um, what's the temporal interpolation method, if any, um, how do you predict precipitation occurrence, how do you account for lapse rates and complex topography, and these methodological choices may have a large impact on, on the work that we're doing. So if we step back, I want to provide a little bit of a review of the different flavors of meteorological data and climate scenarios that are available to us. Um, so um, we can start um, by um, thinking about the station data. So we may have raw station data. And there's a step um, for quality control and imputing missing values um, um, to provide the serially complete station data. Um, we may have um, reanalysis data, and I'll, I'll talk about what that is later. And we may interpolate that reanalysis data and fuse it um, with the station observations to provide spatial meteorological um, data that's suitable for input to our models. Um, and um, we may have um, global climate models um, that are used um, to provide boundary conditions for limited domain regional climate models, or you know some bias correction that's done um, to provide future climate scenarios. So we'll be circling around all of these elements as we're going through the subsequent slides. So the station data, um, there's measurement errors, of course, um, precipitation undercatch, which is a, is a huge issue in snowy environments, um, bridging of snow across um, precipitation gauges, et cetera. Um, problems with um, representativeness of the stations. You know, here's an example of the station by Fortress Mountain, and um, um, it's a very heterogeneous environment, and, and the measurements at the station um, um, may not be representative of, of, of larger areas. So problems with non-homogeneous precipitation accumulation, where you get preferential precipitation accumulation in specific areas, often the sheltered areas, um, blowing snow, um, which can be important um, if we're measuring snow water equivalent using snow pillows. Um, where there's a, 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 a lot of um, um, spatial heterogeneity in, in the snow that we have and, and, and weird stuff. Um, you know, I've um, seen photos of trees growing through snow pillows and um, the impacts that that has on the measurements or um, a herd of cattle who are standing on top of a snow pillow and, um, and um, changing the measurements, you know, that we're getting from that. Um, data quality issues, uh, instrument malfunctions, vandalism, etc. 
And um, this is all leading to gappy data, um, where at a given um, climate station, because of instrument malfunctions, the frequency of site visits, um, time periods of interest, you know, some stations and fire networks, et cetera, are only installed in the summer. Um, new station installations, so new networks coming in, um, networks being discontinued, et cetera, um, are providing um, data that's um, not um, temporally contiguous um, for a long period of time. So the efforts to, to address that um, have been around for a long time. So John Eyshide and um, the NOAA in, in Boulder has worked on this, you know, um, right around the turn of the century. So he was looking at creating serially complete data sets of temperature and precipitation in the Western United States. Um, the figure that I've got here is showing the skill that you can get um, by um, estimating missing values um, from, um, from stations um, throughout the um, Western United States, showing that, showing that, there's, uh, that there's lower skill in the, uh, in the summer months when precipitation is um, more spatially heterogeneous. Um, we have numerical weather prediction um, reanalyses. So I think most people are familiar with numerical weather prediction models. And of course, the numerical weather prediction models um, produce the weather forecasts. Um, it's an initial value problem. So the forecasts are initialized using what's called the analysis. So the analysis is the best estimate of the state of the atmosphere at the start of the forecast period. And um, the analysis is obtained using um, four-dimensional, um, um, very often variational data assimilation methods, um, atmospheric data assimilation methods to provide the best analysis at the start of the forecast period. So what people recognized early on is that those analyses um, were really, really useful um, because um, they could provide an estimate of the state of the atmosphere um, every day a forecast was initialized. And if you stitched together analyses um, from one forecast to the next, to the next, to the next, um, you could stitch together multi years of analyses and provide really useful information for studies of climate variability and change. Um, but the problem with that was that the analyses were generated using different models. So every few months, um, the numerical weather prediction groups would upgrade their model and that would create discontinuities in the analyses that were generated. Um, and older analyses um, were of lower quality. If you've got, um, if you're stitching together analyses over a multi-decadal period or even over a time period of like five or 10 years, um, the models got better over that time period and, um, and you've got lower quality analyses at the start of the time period. So what people did starting around um, <coughs> 1995, et cetera, was um, to push forward the idea of reanalyses. And that's um, to rerun the data assimilation cycle for a long time period using a modern numerical weather prediction model. Um, so the first one was the NCEP NCAR reanalysis um, that was published in, um, in 1995. And um, most um, numerical weather prediction um, modeling groups, or many numerical weather prediction modeling groups, are um, completing reanalyses, you know, with their models. Um, the ACMWF, um, European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, has um, provided some reanalyses that have been of quite high quality. Um, so a lot of people historically have been using the error interim reanalysis in their work. And um, more recently, um, we've been using um, the ERA-5 reanalysis. So um, this is history matching. This is, um, this is where we've got our best estimate of the state of the atmosphere and fluxes like um, precipitation, um, solar radiation, um, some state variables like temperature, um, specific humidity, et cetera, that we can use to drive our models. Um, the, what I'm showing here in the schematic is what we'd have in a global reanalysis. Um, we, there are also some regional reanalyses that are available um, that I'll circle back in a little bit. Um, um, another thing that's being done is Earth system models. Um, so Earth system models often have got similar structure um, to numerical weather prediction models, um, but um, a lot more attention is given to the more slowly varying components of the Earth system, like ocean circulation, um, like um, terrestrial hydrology, you know, things like that, um, cryospheric, cryospheric change. Um, so the Earth system models are used to produce scenarios of Earth system change. 
Um, so the important aspect of Earth system models is that free running. Um, so um, they're um, simulating the evolution of the atmosphere, ocean, land, cryosphere system. And um, what that means is that a specific time in the evolution of the model does not match a specific time in history. Okay, so that's really, really important. If you're using Earth system model output and hydrological applications, um, you can't expect to match um, the 1980 simulation from the Earth system model with um, the um, year 1980 and the historical record in the region where um, model is applied, where your hydrological model is applied. Um, the Earth system models are forced by scenarios of atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases often through representative concentration pathways that provide some scenarios of change, and that enables understanding how societal actions can affect the Earth system. Um, often with Earth system models, we're interested in the dichotomy between internal variability versus the forced response. So if the Earth system models are initialized in just slightly different ways, um, you can get very, very different trajectories of the climate that's produced by those Earth system models. Um, so the, uh, the ensemble of Earth system model simulations with different initial conditions is, is viewed as um, the internal variability. And um, if you average um, multiple ensembles from a single model or multiple Earth system model simulations from multiple modeling groups, as we might have um, from an ensemble of opportunity, um, then that provides us with an opportunity to quantify the forced response. And an example of the forced response may be um, global um, mean temperature. So um, it enables us to ask the questions as to <coughs> if uh, atmospheric um, concentrations of greenhouse gases have increased by a certain amount, what's the impact on um, the global mean temperature? And those are, those are the types of um, in, in, information that are being used um, in a lot of policy discussions around the world. Um, often, you know, the, we don't have a lot of information on the forced response um, specifically for um, variables like precipitation and um, information at um, um, smaller and smaller spatial scales. Um, but um, it, it is important to recognize the difference between the internal variability and the, and, and, and the forced response. So to summarize um, the differences between numerical weather productions, um, weather prediction models and earth system models, the NWP models provide weather or increasingly environmental predictions and the reanalyses are um, what we use um, for studies of historical hydrometeorological variability. Um, the earth system models um, produce scenarios of change and the history um, that we get from an earth system model may not will, will not match um, the history that we have in the historical record. So you can't um, take output from an earth system model, use it as input um, to a hydrological model and um, expect to get um, good calibration results. The only thing that you'll really be able to get from that is um, um, simulations of the seasonal cycle. And if you haven't removed the seasonal cycle from your school metrics, um, then um, 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 you may get um, artificial artificial skill, but really you shouldn't you should you shouldn't be getting any skill from the Earth system models because um, they they do not match history. Um, we also have um, regional climate models. I mentioned this before. Um, the regional climate models are often for a limited geographical domain. Um, they're forced at the boundaries by numer numerical weather prediction model um, reanalyses. So that's an example. So I'm going to talk about how that's been done um, for a lot of the um, CONUS simulations um, that Yan Ping and her group has been actively producing and using in their research. Um, they can be run at the boundaries um, also by an Earth system model. So I'll talk about that as well. And then um, limited um, domain um, regional climate models can also be forced at the domain by a coarser resolution regional model. So here's an example here um, where we're looking at the domain of Europe here on, on the right. And um, that could be forced at the boundaries by reanalysis or output from an Earth system model. Um, but then we have a smaller domain here in the left, um, um, zooming in on the European Alps. And that smaller domain could be forced at the boundaries with output from the coarser domain um, regional model. 
um, the regional climate models um, have much higher resolution and that um, really opens up the opportunity for them to be used um, for studies that we care about. Um, so the two main benefits that we get from the higher resolution is that enables us to explicitly simulate convection. So often what you'll hear these high resolution regional climate models um, being referred to in the literature as convection permitting regional climate models. Um, so that just means that they're run at a high enough resolution, you know, typically less than 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers is often the threshold, but you know, typically much, much, uh, much finer than that, um, that enables you to explicitly resolve convection in the models instead of these um, coarse parameterizations of convection that you have in the coarser scale um, Earth system models. Um, we also have a better representation of topography and processes like orographic precipitation. So that's really, really important um, for a lot of the work that we're doing in mountain environments in order to understand how a, a warmer and moister atmosphere will impact the orographic precipitation. So a, a, a common approach is called um, pseudo-global warming. So you've probably seen a lot of the data sets that are available and um, they're called the PGD, PGW data sets um, for the Kona simulations, for example. So this is a, this is a specific, um, very controlled experiment um, that's used with the regional climate model. So here, you know, we're starting with the historical reanalysis and um, the historical reanalysis is um, forcing um, a regional climate model at the boundaries. Um, so in this example in Europe, you know, at, the, at, the, at these boundaries here um, to provide a, a present day run. Okay. So um, that means that you're, you're doing this and you've got a present day run. So that could be viewed as akin to a regional reanalysis. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, to the extent possible, it preserves the historical hydrometeorological variability um, and the simulations um, within, within the regional model domain. Um, there's, some, there's some twists here, of course, um, because when you go for um, larger and larger region, regional domains, you can get um, drift um, within the regional, regional domains, and there's some approaches that are used um, to control that drift. Um, so in the um, CONUS, um, wharf simulations um, that um, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, they use this approach called spectral nudging, um, which is looking at um, the um, um, longer wavelengths um, within the model domain and then using that um, to, um, to um, adjust the simulations, you know, within the model domain um, so that the simulations were closer um, to history. Um, so for the future, what's done is that you've got the historical reanalysis and um, an example is like error, error interim, for example, um, and then you add a climate change increment to that and then um, use um, the perturbed reanalysis um, to force your regional climate model at the boundaries and that provides a future climate run. So when you're doing that, um, you're getting exactly the same weather um, um, well, not exactly the same weather, but, you know, the same weather patterns um, in the um, um, present day run and in the future climate run. Um, so you're getting um, the same storms and um, the storms um, um, are perturbed in the, in the future climate run because um, we're running with a warmer and moister atmosphere. Um, so because of that, um, you're not getting any changes in the storm tracks, etc. You're not um, um, getting um, any of the changes in atmospheric dynamics that we would um, be able to simulate in an Earth system model. Um, um, but so you can view this as a really controlled experiment that's focusing on the thermodynamic aspects of change um, rather than the dynamical aspects of change. So if we um, go through and then um, begin to review um, what um, meteorological data sets um, we have available. So I mentioned, you know, station data to start with. Um, so we've got raw station data, um, which is subject to quality control um, efforts to impute missing values to create a um, serially complete data set. A um, couple of data sets, serially complete data sets that are available. If you if you need serially complete data, if you want to go all the way back there, um, Go Chung Tang, um, who's who's working as a postdoc with me in my group, um, recently developed um, the serially complete station data set for North America. 
Um, so he's got um, a serially complete time series um, for precipitation and temperature um, for about um, 27,000 stations odd um, across North America. Um, the approaches that he went through there, um, which, um, which could be um, extensible, you know, to other groups who, who, who were working um, with trying to fill in gappy station data, um, quality control, um, different different checks um, for temperature, different checks for precipitation, etc. Um, a number of different infilling and reconstruction strategies, you know, to fill in data um, from major, uh, from neighbouring stations, um, correcting the climatological um, um, biases, um, comparing to benchmark data sets, etc. Um, so this paper is uh, is already published and available in um, Earth System Sciences and Data. If you if you want to use these data, um, but if the methodological steps um, that Go Chang used um, to develop this data set are uh, 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 of interest in your own work, if you've if you've got a um, a task to um, fill in the gaps in existing station data, then you know we're ha happy to share that information. And, and help you with that. Um, um, Go Chang extended this recently and um, developed a serially complete data set um, for stations around the world. Um, a, a, a few um, methodological differences, but this is now for a much longer period, 1950 um, to 2019, and that's under review in the Journal of Climate. Um, so um, we're hoping that um, the the work that's done here can um, support a lot of the ongoing activities that we have in the Planetary Water Prediction Initiative. Um, here's um, a graphic showing um, what we're doing, you know, for example, stations, precipitation, mean temperature, T range, um, dew point temperature, um, and, and wind speed, and um, the, the skill um, that, we're, that we're getting um, by interpolating data, by filling in the missing data um, from, um, from neighboring stations. Here we're using a variant of the Klingupta efficiency to quantify the skill, you know, the, um, the red values here uh, um, representing the higher skill. Um, the next set, as we're as we're um, stepping up, is um, looking at um, reanalysis data, and uh, potentially um, combining that with the um, station data that we have um, to provide um, spatial meteorological data at a spatial scale that's useful um, for our, our impact models. Uh, there's a number of data sets um, that are available. Um, a common one um, that's been quite popular um, in North America is DAMET. Um, so DAMET has got a simplified um, version of um, topographic regression. Um, it's a deterministic data set that's available from 1980 to 2019 at a one kilometer resolution um, across um, North America. There's um, other, other data sets that have been used. Um, the thin plate splines is a method that, have been, that has been used um, to produce um, NRCAN met and um, P and WNA met. Um, this is off, um, from the um, um, PCIC, um, who's been um, putting these together. So these are um, deterministic data sets um, over larger domains in Canada. Um, the um, Livna data set and previously the Mora data set is um, mostly for the contiguous United States, but it goes far enough into Canada um, that um, it includes a lot of the transboundary basins that are important to us. It goes far enough north into Canada so that it includes all of the Columbia, all of like the Milk, um, St. Mary, all of the Suris, etc. Um, so um, this is a data set that's based on climatologically aided interpolation. Um, so there you've got, you know, one interpolation that you have um, using climatological data, another interpolation that you have um, using um, the finer temporal resolution data. And um, you effectively interpolate the anomalies and then add the anomalies um, to the interpolated climatological fields. Um, some of our work um, was um, working in the contiguous United States and then um, Alaska and Hawaii using topographic regression um, to, um, to estimate um, precipitation and temperature um, in an ensemble framework. So we've got ensembles of precipitation and temperature that we can use um, to characterize the uncertainty that we have in our hydrological model simulations. Um, and a big thing in Canada, the biggest thing that we have in Canada is CAPA. This is um, the Canadian precipitation analysis. So this has been um, brainchild of Vincent Fortin um, that he's been pushing um, for, for many, many, many years. 
Um, what I'm showing here is an example of um, the Kappa application over the Canadian Rockies. This was um, from work by Vincent VNA and Dorothy Dunford um, and their work to provide um, um, Kappa simulations of the 2013 um, Canmore Calgary flood. Um, Vincent Viennet and his colleagues have just finished a CAPA reanalysis, um, which is um, beginning to become available. It's not available just yet, but will be available very, very soon at a 10 kilometer resolution over North America. Um, so I think this is going to be um, become um, the go-to data set, the go-to data set on spatial meteorological fields that we can use for a lot of our applications, um, both for driving our hydrological models directly and also um, by using it as a basis um, for bias correction of output that we might have from um, atmospheric reanalyses or Earth system models. Um, the interesting thing is if we compare a lot of gridded products, um, this is from a paper by Brian Hen and Jessica Lundquist that I was involved in um, over California. Um, what we're showing here is um, the spatial patterns of precipitation um, from six different data sets. And um, we're seeing that all of the data sets are providing different portrayals of um, precipitation um, with differences as much as 500 millimeters or greater than or equal to 25% um, across the different data sets. And often, you know, if you just download, you know, one of these data sets um, and um, pump it through your model, you may implicitly consider this as truth. It's clearly not truth. Um, and there's a lot of work that we need to do to really characterize the uncertainties in these data sets and understand how the uncertainties in spatial meteorological forcing data propagate through our hydrological systems. If we um, extend this even further, um, we're interested in um, global climate models. Um, so um, we can use output from global climate models directly. Um, if um, our uh, um, the spatial scale of our analysis is um, sufficiently coarse um, to support that. Um, but often what we have is that the global climate models as you are used as boundary conditions for regional climate models um, or bias corrected or statistically downscaled um, to produce um, the future climate scenarios. I'm going to talk about this a, a little bit in the, in the subsequent slides. Um, global climate models are also now um, called um, Earth system models. Um, you can pretty much um, use the two terms um, interchangeably, um, but Earth system models really, if we're um, getting for more precise definitions, uh, having a more complete treatment of um, biogeochemical cycles as well as um, the energy and water cycles. So here's a paper that um, is being led by um, my colleague and friend, um, Simon Papalexio. Um, so um, Simon Papalexio is interested in um, the portrayal of drought in the CMIP-6 models. So um, all of these different earth system modeling um, groups have got together in um, providing a data set um, from the coupled model into comparison experiment. Um, so this is, this is really, a model into comparison experiment that's primarily focused on um, data set delivery, where all, all of the participating Earth system modeling groups are providing the output um, in the same format um, so that um, we can have an ensemble of opportunity um, from multiple Earth system modeling groups um, that we can use in our assessment of the impacts of change. Um, so what we're, what we're seeing here in this figure is that Simon's um, been able to um, show that um, um, the models in CMIP-6 are providing a, a pretty good um, portrayal of drought now and um, they can be used um, in their raw form um, pretty much um, for, a, a, for a lot of global scale assessments of hydroclimatic variability. Um, Simon and his team are also working on downscaling the CMIP-6 models um, in Canada so that we can, uh, using statistical methods um, so that we can, we can use CMIP-6 um, for a lot of our impact assessment work. Um, a, a popular data set that's been used extensively in global water futures has been um, the wharf Kona simulations. Here I'm providing an, an, an example of um, the Wharf Conus 1. Um, so 
This is um, what I talked about before, where we've got a historical reanalysis. In this case, it was the error interim um, that was used as input to the WARF regional climate model um, to provide the, um, the present day run. Um, the historical reanalysis has also got a climate change increment associated with it. Um, also input to the WARF regional climate model to provide a, a future climate run. And then we can look at the difference between those two runs. Um, as, a, as I mentioned before, um, this preserves the historical hydrometeorological variability and um, doesn't enable any analysis of changes in storm tracks, etc. So Yan Ping has also been doing some wharf simulations of her own um, over, over Canada um, that's been using a very, very similar approach to this. And um, so those um, data have been used in a lot of the studies as well. So here's a, here's a picture of um, observations and um, simulations of, of precipitation in the eastern part of the US, um, showing that um, the, the simulations uh, um, that we get from WARF are very, very similar um, from the observations. And my colleague, um, Andy Prine, who's done this work, when he presents this, he always uh, likes to remove the labels from the plot and remove um, what's observed and what's simulated and say, OK, you know, based on these spatial fields, um, what do you think of the observations? And, you know, it can be unless you know what you're doing and looking very carefully over the ocean. Um, it can it can be very very difficult to um, to distinguish between the two, um, and this and this study here, um, what he was doing is um, um, treating storms as objects and um, looking at um, the propagation of storms in, in a Lagrangian sense, um, and um, this is um, feeding into feeding into his paper. Um, that we published in um, Nature Climate Change, when we're um, taking a Lagrangian perspective instead of a Eulerian perspective, and we're able to look at um, not just changes in um, precipitation intensity that we'd have at a point, um, but we're able to look at um, changes in the rain volume, um, changes in the rain rate, changes in the rain area, um, the translation of storms, etc., et and provide um, much deeper information of the um, changes in precipitation um, that we'd um, get in a, in, in a warmer climate. What we showed in this paper is that a lot of the changes in um, rain area and um, the propagation um, were really, really important in affecting um, the volume of precipitation that we could get um, from individual storms. Um, this is um, showing this in a little bit more detail um, where um, we're looking at the different aspects of storms, you know, the size of the storms on the x-axis, the precipitation volume on the y-axis, the um, maximum storm intensity, um, precipitation volume, and the speed of the storm and the precipitation volume, which is um, showing this in a little bit more detail. Um, and the overall annual changes in, in storms um, that we can see that the um, climatologies, you know, are, um, are quite similar, um, but um, because we've got this controlled experiment, it's allowing us to um, have um, fairly direct um, assessments of change. Um, we use this in um, some work that we did um, with, with Keith Musselman and um, looking at changes in rain on snow events um, across um, the um, Western US and, and Southern, Southern Canada um, from these simulations. Um, so the output from these um, regional climate models um, were almost able to be directly used in a lot of our hydroclimatic assessments. Um, underway at the moment is, um, is CONUS-2. Um, so CONUS 2 actually isn't for the CONUS, it's for, it's for North America, um, but, it's, but it's called CONUS 2. And um, this is taking a different approach um, to the PGW approach, um, where um, on, the, on the left side, where instead of using reanalysis, the model is being forced with a historical climate model run, um, which is bias corrected um, with error interim reanalysis um, forced um, through uh, um, regional climate model to produce the present day run. Um, so um, what that means is that that history that you get um, will not match um, the history and the historical record um, as, as um, 
um, was um, present in the in the CONUS one simulations. Um, for the future, they were using a, a single future climate model run, um, adjusting the climatology to match the ensemble mean of the CMIP five models, um, pumping that through a regional climate model and um, getting the future climate run. And, and taking, taking this approach, because the temporal variability is from a free-running Earth system model, um, it doesn't match history, but it also allows you to um, look at interesting things um, like um, changes in storm tracks, et cetera. Um, I'm just looking at the time now. Um, I've covered most of the important work that I, that I really wanted to cover. I've got um, a some slides on quantifying uncertainty, but um, I wonder if it would be useful, Prabeen, if I just pause here and um, see if there's any any discussion or, or questions based on what I've presented so far. Uh, I don't see any questions. I think uh, people may be waiting for the question and answer session to ask the questions. Okay. So should I keep going? I'll pause for a minute to see if anybody wants wants to add anything to the discussion now. I'm not hearing anything from you, Prabhu, so I'll just keep going. Yeah. If if my mouse decides to work. Okay. So now we're interested in quantifying uncertainty. So um, here's a time series of um, precipitation and temperature. Um, this is um, for, a, for a station in Colorado. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of uncertainty that we have in our spatial meteorological estimates. And we strive to um, quantify that uncertainty explicitly so that we can understand how that uncertainty propagates through our hydrological simulations. Um, so we've generated, instead of a, um, a single time series of precipitation and temperature for our model elements, we've generated an ensemble that we're using as input to our models. Um, the ensemble of um, of um, forcing data that we have um, translates um, into ensemble streamflow estimates and allows us to ask questions. Um, what's the uncertainty that we have in streamflow simulations that's associated with the uncertainty that we have in our, um, the spatial meteorological forcing data that's used as, as the model inputs. Um, when we're um, when we're getting in the, into the mountains and, you know, other areas, um, we often see that the uncertainty that we have in precipitation is, is the dominant source of uncertainty that we have in many environments. It's important to um, quantify that uncertainty directly. Um, we, we looked at this um, years ago, actually, um, in um, a paper that I did with, um, with, with Drew Slater. Um, back, oh gosh, this was about 15 or 20 years ago, um, when we were um, uh, developing a method um, for probabilistic quantitative precipitation estimation in complex terrain. Um, so our approach was to use um, topographic regression um, to estimate um, the CDF of precipitation at each grid cell, and then um, use spatially correlated random numbers um, to sample from that CDF um, to provide um, a number of ensemble members um, that were equally plausible representations of reality. So what I'm showing here in the bottle is um, three ensemble members um, that provide um, what we um, can construct as equally plausible representations of the spatial precipitation field. So all of those ensemble members, uh, equally plausible representations of precipitation that occurred on the specific day, um, which is uh, portrayed on the left there. Um, we can see that, you know, the general features are there. We're getting more precipitation um, in the southwestern part of the domain um, than, in the, than in the eastern part of the domain. Um, but there's large uncertainty that we have in our estimates of precipitation. This was um, extended um, by my colleague Andy Newman um, in his paper in Journal of Hydrometeorology in 2015. Um, so here, yeah, um, this is the same domain that was used by Ben Livner in his deterministic data set. Um, so um, we applied these methods to provide an ensemble data set that's available um, for um, the contiguous United States and um, the southern part of Canada. 
Um, here's um, some examples here. So on the left is um, the simulations of precipitation from two example ensemble members, ensemble member 11 and 75. Um, and the ensemble mean, so those two ensemble members are equally plausible representations of reality. The ensemble mean on the upper right um, and the ensemble standard deviation in, 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 in the lower left. And the nice thing that we're getting out of this data set is that we've got space-time variations in the uncertainty. And what we're seeing here is that the uncertainty in precipitation was higher in the southern part of the domain, um, where we have more convective precipitation with um, lower correlation length scales. Um, the data set was constructed from 1980 to 2012, freely available daily spatial fields of precipitation and temperature, 100 ensemble members. Andy Wood has been um, picking up on this, making this data set available in real time, um, a lot of methodological extensions to this, and, and he's, he's using this as an ensemble component of his um, experimental streamflow forecasting systems. Um, when we compare to other data sets, this is compared to MARA, which is similar to the, to the Livner data set. Um, we're seeing that we've got a better delineation between the mountains and the valleys. We're not getting the speckled effects um, that we get in deterministic data sets where we begin to see the impact of individual stations, et cetera. And that's important for energy balance models. If we do some probabilistic evaluation, um, looking at um, the reliability and discrimination, so reliability is the extent to which um, your observed frequencies are matching your estimated probabilities. Um, so we want to be on the one-to-one -one line. Um, the discrimination is where we're looking at um, the probability distribution um, for when an event occurred and when an event um, did not occur. Um, so we want um, um, separation um, between those two um, PDFs. So we can get, get getting good reliability and you know some discrimination. And I'll show you some figures from some other studies um, that show similar probabilistic verification methods. Um, we've extended this um, to Alaska. We've got the paper that's um, that's come out in Alaska. Um, which is um, taking advantage of a recent data rescue effort in Alaska. And so we um, produce simulations um, for the Alaska and the Yukon. Um, the new methods that we applied here are climatologically aided interpolation and um, characterizing the uncertainty and precipitation aid and undercatch based on our knowledge of gauge type on the Canadian and the, and the US side of the border. Um, and um, some example ensemble products um, that, um, that we're um, developing here um, and some comparison um, to some existing products. So these, these, these are available for use and I'm looking forward to um, seeing them used um, in a lot of our hydrological modeling applications. Um, and this is um, comparing our observed probability of precipitation against the ensemble probability of precipitation in our data set and the DayMet data set, um, which, is, which is also available. Um, estimates of our um, precipitation adjustment um, um, that, um, that I mentioned, where we're characterizing the uncertainty that we have in precipitation under catch accounting for the gauge site, the gauge type on either side of the border. Um, what Go Chang has done, and um, this is um, a paper that's under review now in Earth System Sciences and Data, so the paper is available for people, you know, if they want to see it, is that we're extending this to North America. The challenge that we have when we're doing it over North America is um, the sparse station network that we have at the higher latitudes. Um, and so what Go Chang did to address that issue is optimal interpolation um, between the station um, precipitation estimates and um, the precipitation that's available for reanalysis products. So this is um, the methodology here, um, looking at uh, bringing together the station um, regression um, with the reanalysis data, um, combining them to and um, providing the ensemble meteorological forcing data set for North America, um, providing ensemble estimates um, for um, using a, a hundred ensemble members that are available so that we can um, quantify the uncertainty that we have in our spatial meteorological forcing data and propagate that through our models. Um, this is just looking at um, the skill that we're getting um, for um, the um, probability of precipitation, the ensemble, 
and um, oh no, the um, the climatology of um, um, probability of precipitation, what we're getting from the ensemble, um, the difference, and the discrimination and reliability diagrams are looking quite similar to um, what we've had in, in, in the previous studies. Um, so this is just a, a, a summary of the data set. Um, 100 ensemble members available at about 10 kilometer resolution from 1979 to 2018. Um, people are beginning to do this in Europe. So here's, a, here's an example where people have applied um, very, very similar methods in Europe um, with um, station-based interpolation um, um, over the European Alps, um, a European-wide product. Um, um, very, very similar approaches. So these are, for example, equally plausible representations of reality um, using um, similar approaches to, to, what, to what we have used um, and looking again at their um, reliability and discrimination um, to produce um, probabilistic assessments that are useful. Um, the applications are in areas like um, snow data assimilation. So here's an example of our earlier work. This is where we developed the method in the first place, where we've got control simulations of snow water equivalent um, for some example stations in Colorado. And we're using this as to quantify the uncertainty that we have in snow simulations um, that we use as a prior in our um, data assimilation algorithms. Um, Hong Li um, has uh, Hong Li Lu has also um, done used this data set um, for hydrological data assimilation um, for her um, stream flow uh, assimilating stream flow observations into into a hydrological model. Um, another application is um, numerical weather prediction um, verification. So we're interested in here as um, um, when um, does our numerical weather prediction model fall outside of our observed ensemble so that we can um, use that to focus attention on um, areas where, that, we, that we really need to improve. I'll just quickly um, finish with a couple of research challenges, and these are, these are mostly focused on developing historical spatial meteorological forcing data sets. Um, um, one um, set of challenges is the is the better estimation method. So, how can we infill station methods? How can we um, do a better job of interpolating the information that we have across space? Um, Go Chang's um, managed to make significant progress on on, on this bullet in recent times. Um, idea and data sparse environments is to use river basins as massive precipitation gauges. So, how can we use the information that we have in streamflow records to infer um, what the precipitation could have been and use that in combination with the station data that we have. Um, merging station data with radar data, satellite data, numerical weather prediction model output. We've touched on this a little bit, but there's a lot more that um, can be done there. Um, and methods to estimate non-routine meteorological observations, radiation, wind speed, humidity, etc., using a mix of empirical methods and numerical weather prediction model output. Um, there's also methods to temporarily aggregate the daily observations to the time steps that we need in our hydrological models. Um, also the need for better uncertainty quantification methods. Um, we do have statistically reliable estimates of uncertainty because we've estimated our uncertainty through cross-validation methods. Um, there's a lot of work um, that we need to do um, when we don't know what the observation is, and um, where there's a lot of measurement error associated with precipitation undercatch. Um, so there's a lot of work that's needed in order to characterize that uncertainty. That's an enormous, um, enormous research topic there. And um, better ensemble generation methods. This is this is something that Simon Papalexio has been spending a lot of time on. A lot of our ensemble generation methods use um, isotropic. Um, spatially correlated random fields um, that um, don't really account um, for the impact on topography and other factors on, on the spatial correlations structure. We don't really account for propagating trans systems, wet dry, wet dry transitions, etc. And what Simon has done in the Cosmos package has really been um, pushing this field forward in, in general area of stochastic hydrometeorology. 
there's a lot to do. There's also, um, if um, Yan Ping gave this talk, I'm sure she would talk about a lot of the challenges that we have um, with regional climate modeling, um, a lot of challenges associated with um, statistical downscaling, et cetera, and um, a lot of thought needed um, to develop a um, consistent and small set of products that we need um, to support a lot of our um, hydrometeorological modeling applications. So end it there and, and see if there's any questions now. Or, or points for discussion. Thank you, Martin. Uh, that was a very informative presentation. Uh, we have got a few questions. So the first question is from Suzanne and she's asking, is it typical for a meteorological data to use Kelvin for temperature uh, as depicted in the Gaussian distribution figure? Uh, please clarify why this unit would be used instead of uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit. Oh, okay. Um, so generally, we try to use um, um, SI units, and Kelvin is the SI unit. Um, so that can be a little bit confusing, um, um, especially you know when we're interested in departures from the freezing point, as we as we'd have in Celsius. Um, so a lot of the models are expecting um, the um, information in SI units and, and Kelvin um, because that's that's the unit and and the hydrological models. Um, so that's what we do. Um, um, some data sets um, present the information in um, degrees Celsius. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very rare um, to see a data set um, with the units in Fahrenheit because, because that's not an, um, an SI unit. Uh, the second question is from Andrew Ayerson. And so his question is, if you're doing process-based uh, hydrology work in Canada, then uh, simulating small to medium water set, uh, so do we stick with CM Kappa product then to drive our models? Should we, uh, should we stick with the Kappa product? Yes, uh, to yeah. drive the hydrological model. Yeah, so we were talking, so Vincent 14 is um, the developer of the Kappa product, and um, that's, that's going to be the benchmark um, that's, that, that we should use um, for all, all of our applications. Um, we haven't um, done a um, rigorous and um, systematic methodological comparison um, across you know, the um, different data sets um, that are available in Canada that really needs to be done in order to answer that question quantitatively. Um, but um, based on what I know goes into the Kappa product um, and um, with um, a lot of um, the uh, um, assimilation of you know, different sources of information, um, I, th I think you know, that's definitely a, um, a very good place to start. Um, and like in, in the absence of the quantitative comparisons um, across alternative products. Um, if, you, if, you, if you're interested in um, an uncertainty and precipitation and how the uncertainty and precipitation or uncertainty in spatial meteorological fields and how that uncertainty in spatial meteorological fields propagates through the system, then you won't be able to do that with Kappa um, because um, they don't have a um, long retrospective ensemble. Um, there is a group in Montreal who are um, developing an ensemble version of Kappa as well, and I think um, I think that will be useful. But they don't have a long ensemble hindcast. So, so if you're interested in the propagation of uncertainty, then um, you can use the um, data set that Gochang's produced. Um, but uh, without any additional information right now, I'd say you know, Kappa is probably the go-to data set um, to use um, for um, statistical downscaling. Um, bias correction and um, um, as input for your hydrological models. Uh, next question is from Febatala. Uh, so he says, you mentioned that all system models do not match historical data. So should we expect less skill to simulate the history uh, hydroclimate variables as precipitation, for example, when compared to the, some real observations? Yes. And so you and you need to do your evaluation in a very very deliberate way. Um, so um, if you're if you're running um, if you're forcing your model um, with Earth system model output, you should never compute a Nash Sutcliffe score because that's absolutely meaningless. Um, the only thing, as I mentioned, the only thing that um, you'll be able to do is um, replicate the um, the seasonal cycle. So um, so you um, so you may get um, Nash Sutcliffe scores above zero um, just because um, you're replicating the seasonal cycle, but um, you're not going to be able to predict departures from the seasonal cycle um, using approaches like that. Uh, 
we have another question from Al. Uh, so for your point station data bias correction, how does your work compare with the homogenized data produced by the operational product of, by ECC? Sorry, what was the question? Uh, for your point uh, station data bias correction, so I'm assuming it's related to Gojang work. Uh, how does your work compare with the homogenized data produced as an operational product by ECC? So the homogenized product is for a really, really small set of stations. Um, and um, they've um, taken a much more careful approach um, than what we were able to do with the, with the, with the larger set of stations. Um, some, of, uh, some of the quality control approaches are quite similar. And, um, but you know, we, we, did, we did not um, spend any effort to try and understand, you know, the impacts of um, station data moves and, you know, stuff like that. So Al, I can, I can talk to you about that um, afterwards, if you like. Uh, so we have another question from Chandra and she's asking, what is the difference between uh, all system model and land system model? Uh, are there any benefits of using a uh, land system, uh, system model over our system model for hydrological applications? Um, so uh, um, earth system model versus a, versus a land model? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, the land models are the terrestrial component of an earth system model. Um, so they're um, so they're really inseparable. Um, so um, we can um, run an earth system model, and then we can we can get um, we can get some of the land variables out of um, out of the earth system model. Um, um, the land models can also be run offline. Um, so we have the land models that are embedded in the Earth system model, and um, they, they can be run using um, downscale data sets and um, provide um, additional information. So typically what we see is the Earth system model grid is quite coarse. Um, so it may be um, 50 kilometers on a side or 100 kilometers on a side. Um, so the hydrological variables that we get from the Earth system model aren't necessarily meaningful. Um, what we can do is um, provide downscaling of the Earth system model output um, at the, to provide information at the spatial scales that are useful for us, and then use that information as input um, to um, the same land model that was run in the Earth system model or, or another land model, and then um, provide um, simulations of the um, hydrology variables that, that we really need for our impact studies. Uh, we have another question from Saman Razavi, and he's uh, just wondering if you have any experience with ERA-5 LAN. Uh, it provides climate data with 10 kilometer resolution. Yeah, so we um, we talked about that with Florian Pappenberger, who's the head of forecasting at ECMWF. Um, the the ERA-5 LAN um, has got really limited um, spatial downscaling approaches. From what we understand um, is that they're Current approaches are, are really just based on um, topographic downscaling of temperature and not much more than that. Um, so if, if you're interested in the, um, the ERA-5 um, land um, spatial meteorological fields, um, then we can do a much better job um, using, using our methods um, than, um, than what we're doing in ERA-5 land. And, um, and Florian completely agreed with that. And he said, okay, you know, based on what you're doing, if you're only interested in the spatial meteorological forcing data, um, use um, the coarser resolution ERA-5 data and um, produce the finer resolution information yourself. Um, the um, ERA-5 land hydrological variables um, are going to be very, very interesting um, for benchmarking. So um, looking at ERA-5 simulations of snow, uh, ERA-5 land simulations of um, snow, soil moisture, et cetera, um, are gonna be are gonna be really, really useful. Um, but if you're just interested in ERA-5 land as, as forcing data, um, we can do better than that. Um, Florian did say that um, there, um, working on improving ERA-5 land and that um, and that, that take-home message um, may not be true when they get their um, second version of ERA-5 land complete. Uh, we are four minutes past the hour mark, but I have one question that I, I really wanted to ask. So, um, so in one of your slides, you saw that there were six different forcing data and they had uh, differences of about 25% to each other. So that was even translated to like 500 millimeter uh, of the rainfall. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering like if, you know, uh, I want to do a, a hydrological simulations, then 
So one thing that you want to do is to use all of those data because you know they all are different and then you can capture the, 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 the uncertainty, right? But then you cannot calibrate your model with all the data because it's computationally expensive. So what would be the most, you know, like appropriate and but not computationally expensive way to, to address those issues in your, in your modeling? Okay, so there's two things there. Um, the first is that you can sort of use multiple data sets um, to quantify the uncertainty, um, but um, that would be an approach that we would call an ensemble of opportunity, is that uh, six different groups created six different data sets and then we can use them all. Um, but some of those data sets um, may get um, the wrong results for the same reason, um, which, which means that um, the difference among those data sets uh, may not be a good estimate of the true uncertainty that we have, right? So I think our approach, um, which is to, and to instead of rely on ensemble of opportunity, um, develop ensemble spatial meteorological forcing fields um, where we um, directly um, quantify the uncertainty that's there through rigorous cross-validation methods. Um, we, we know that um, those approaches are much more statistically reliable than we have with an ensemble of opportunity. So we can, we can use those um, because we've quantified the uncertainty directly. And then what we've, what we've been using is that we've just been using um, individual ensemble members um, from that ensemble data set um, for model calibration. And um, that's got some advantages because what we see with the deterministic data sets is that we have a, a lot of problems with spatial smoothing. So the spatial smoothing can mean that you overestimate um, that your precipitation occurrence because you're merging wet and dry stations together. And it can mean that you underestimate the extremes. So when you're using an ensemble member um, from an um, 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 ensemble data set, um, we've got um, much better estimates of the precipitation occurrence and, and the extremes, much better estimates of the full probability distribution. And, and we found that to be quite useful in our model calibration efforts. Uh, I think that will be all for today. Uh, thank you again, Martin. Uh, I also want to thank everyone who attended this webinar. Uh, the video recording of this webinar will be available later today in the Chrome Worlding website. Uh, just before we leave, any, is there any last comment, uh, uh, Martin, that you want to say? No, thanks everyone. And of course, reach out to me or Yan Ping or Prabin or um, Julie Tarot or any, any, anyone else with expertise in, in these areas. Um, if you want to um, talk about the data sets that you're using in your own work and you know what some of the limitations and advantages would be of alternative data sets. Uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, thanks, everyone. Please have a good day.